Uh, I want to know about some of the things that happened on stage, on set, um, on the ship where you were filming, on, the, in, on set. Tell me about your first kiss, your first on-screen kiss, uh, Jill, because you, you started really, really young. <laughs> I mean, it was my first kiss off stage or on stage, and I got to do it in front of an entire crew of Teamsters. <laughs> <laughs> who I loved dearly, but not necessarily wanted to kiss in front of them. Um, it was a, a <laughs> mortifying experience. Who, do you remember who was with? Who was it, who was it with? <sighs> I can't remember if it was Glenn Scarpelli, or if it was Jimmy Osmond. I think it was Glenn. I think it probably was Glenn. And the great part is Glenn and I are still friends today, and he's gay, so I think that's my fault. <laughs> At least that's what he tells me. He's so powerful. That's right. Memories are made. So beyond beyond romance, you also you were doing schooling while you were you were on the ship. Were you on set? What, what was the filming like? Like growing up on a ship. Um, well, for me, because I didn't have any other experience, that was my only childhood. For me, it was super normal. But um, it was we would have to do a certain amount of hours of school during the day. So while everybody else was filming, I would be upstairs with my tutor. Uh, <coughs> One of the great perks was that my school was nice enough to try to arrange what my studies were depending on where we were traveling. So I was taking an Asian civilization course and I was reading about the Great Wall of China while I was sitting on it. <laughs> so that was pretty amazing. And the only downside is when we would be in these beautiful locations, whether it be Mexico or the Mediterranean or Australia or wherever, on a day when everybody had the day off, and it was when we had smaller ships, so we had portholes, we didn't have balconies back then. And I would just be sitting there with my tutor, in my little miserable cabin, <laughs> looking out at the beautiful ocean, knowing everybody was upstairs by the pool, that's the only downside, but I made up for it. <laughs> Wonderful. Now, uh, Bernie, Bernie Cabell, Doc was a ladies' man. Oh, boy. <laughs> Top on-screen romance moment. Oh, boy. <laughs> I have had a crush on uh, Juliet Prowse uh, for, for quite a while. A stunning actress. And uh, I get the script, Doc's Exchange. And right away I called the office and I said, who's playing Samantha? Who is playing Samantha? And I said, wait a second, I looked it up, looked it up. Juliet Browse. I said, oh, how lucky can I get? So we have a scene. It, it's, it's like we had been married and I think I gave her 50 bucks, go get a divorce because you have annoying habits. And she said, well, you have annoying habits. But we were very, uh, how should I say, involved with each other. So we have this scene, and the scene is in bed. Now you're surrounded by 70 people. Camera, <laughs> camera sound, gawkers, grips, <laughs> all this. And you say, how can we be intimate in this situation? And I wore a hairpiece. Uh, on this. Not everybody knows it, but it was... Uh... Everybody knows it. <laughs> You'll get your spot. <laughs> so I'm there, and I'm very concerned about the hairpiece falling off. It did not fall off. And she says, in, in a very quiet way, you know, Charles Boyer had a scene like this, and uh, with a very attractive lady, and very similar to this scene that we have right now. So uh, he said to his beautiful leading lady, if darling, if possibly during this very sexy scene, I get aroused, <laughs> forgive me, please. <laughs> and if possibly I don't get aroused, forgive me, please. <laughs> We had, we had 
many, many Academy Award winners, many Academy Award with Marie, but Ava Marie Saint, uh, Shirley Jones, um, the man who won the Academy, John Mills, thank you. Uh, so many Academy Award winners. Ray Land, who won the Academy Award for Lost Weekend. It was a treat for us to be dealing with these people, and because of Gavin, we would always come up to them, make nice, and say, oh, we are so thrilled to have you on our set working with us. And that was a major thrill, having these uh, Academy Award winners. And um, great, great stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, Lauren, you were cast as Julie, the cruise director. Might I say, coming from a cruise director, you are my favorite cruise director. <laughs> Have you ever been called Julie? I, it's because me and Julie have the same hair. That's true. This yeah. is a weird. Did you get it from Bernie? <laughs> so, what was it like for you for the the audition process, the casting process? Because, like I said, it happened real close to the airing and the creation of the show. I was cast the night before we started filming the pilot. So I found out at nine o'clock at night that in the morning I was coming back to change my life for the next 45 years. <laughs> I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> yeah, I was cast the night before. Gotcha, so, so who was cast in the original? So there, there was like, there were three pilots. Who were the, who was in the first group? Who's in the second group? Who's None of group? us. The second pilot, you three, right? Yeah and then the third pilot, Gavin and I, and Jill, the show didn't become complete till Jill showed up in a couple episodes. <laughs> and you were supposed to, and Jill, you were supposed to be just like, just a, just a walk-on role, like a real quick one kind of thing, yeah? Um, I was doing another show for Aaron Spelling at the time uh, called Friends, but not the Friends that, <laughs> you know, or I would be driving a much nicer car. But, <laughs> uh, as Aaron did with all of the people, all of the corral of actors that he had on all of his shows, whether it be Charlie's Angels or Dynasty or Hotel or whatever, they would all come through the love boat. And I was just one of the lucky ones that got to do that. And I played the part of Vicky, but not as Vicky Steubing, but just as the part of Vicky. And it was inferred that I might be the captain's daughter, uh, but I had a show to go back to. But when I went back to my show, we were canceled, and so Aaron called me at home and said, would you come back? <laughs> Ted Lange. Yes, sir. <laughs> that happened recently, too. That yes, happened immediately. <laughs> 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 Let's play that game. Yeah. Ted Lange. No, yeah. no, no. Those of you that missed it, I'm gonna catch them up. Do, do you want to tell the story, Fred? Do you want to tell? You were there for it, for the Yes No Game show. I'll tell the story. <laughs> no, 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 wait. There wait. is a game called Yes No. <laughs> and Duval said, "Do you want to play?" And I said, "Yes." <laughs> and I walked to the hot seat, and I'm fully the confident that I could, I would not say yes or no for three minutes. Is that correct? That's, That's the game. Right. Don't say yes or no for three minutes. One guy did 10 seconds. I said, well, I know I can beat that. And someone else did about a minute. So I walked and I sat down and I was really cool. And Duval says, you know how to play this game? All right, we're gonna play the game. They do a countdown, three, two, one, and you're on. And Duval said, Ted Land. I said, yeah. <laughs> I want to say something about uh, Julie McCoy. Aaron Spelling was superstitious, and if you go back and you look at some of his shows, you'll find on uh, Mod Squad, the girl's name is Julie. 
always been doing. And okay. you'll find on the rookies, uh, Kate Jackson's character was named Julie. <laughs> and so everybody's trying to figure out, well, how do we make this work? He says, I've never had a problem with a show when the female was named Julie. <laughs> so we're going to call her character Julie McCoy. <laughs> and for whatever reason, it worked. She's the reason. <laughs> yes. and, and, and the book is called The Love Boats. And Geraldine was a cruise director in the 60s, I think. And she was an actual woman and doing the job. At, but on Cru Princess Cruises, there were no women cruise directors. I'm not sure there are now. I think you there were, are now. There are, there are some now, but you were the first. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was just playing it on TV, Duval. I could never do your job. <laughs> you worked too hard. <laughs> I know. My dream job is to be retired. <laughs> I'm there now. I love it. <laughs> be my example. I'm following it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but did you have to, did you have to do any research to be a cruise director? I tried. Well, once the show got picked up, yeah. uh, I mean, for the pilot, no, I just made it up. But uh, for the pilot, <laughs> I called Princess Cruises and asked Brian Langsford Carter, if you're an old princess guy, you know who I'm talking about. One of the officers from England, he was in charge of all the cruise directors. And he was very clear that there is no possible way a woman could play, could be a cruise director. But it was lovely of me to try. <laughs> Look at you. The most that was the beginning of my time on television. <laughs> and now you're the most famous cruise director in the world. Bartender, like an actual licensed bartender for for the role to to like research it and things, didn't you? Yeah. Well, actually, uh, as probably most of you know, if you read anything about actors, that there are bartenders somewhere <laughs> okay. in their career, you know, between gigs, they're tending bar. I never did that. <laughs> I never knew anything about tending bar. So. Um, after the first year of the show, I realized I better learn something about tending bar because if you ever watch the first year of the series, I'm always holding a blender and pouring the drink into it. But I didn't know how to pour, free pour, or any of the cut limes, cut lemons, or any, I knew nothing. So uh, I went to bartending school in Los Angeles and they gave me two diplomas. One for Isaac Washington, which we put up in the Alcapulco Lounge, and one for Ted Lange. When the series ended, I could get a gig. <laughs> That's right. In, 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 in bartending school, is that where you learn the, the, the point? <laughs> ah, no, I did not learn the point in bartending school. When, when, when did you know that the, the point, the you got it, when did you know that was a thing? Did you, you know, know when uh, you were doing it? We, we were doing a show. I didn't, you know, you don't think anything about it, but people watch everything. And so in the opening, I would, I would do this, or I'd do it with two hands, and I, you, you don't think about it. You're saying, hey, I'm on the show. Please watch, you know? Uh, but you have well, to I tell how come you did that, though. Huh? You have to tell how come you did that, because okay. it's such a great story. All right. I, um, yes. <laughs> I, we, were, we had to, if you see the opening credits, you see we all look into the lens. Right. Mm -hmm. And so the uh, producer, Henry Coleman, said, Ted, stand behind this little thing over here and just look into the lens and smile. And I said, well, but Henry, because I'm an actor, you know, I, I studied in New York. I, I, why am I looking into the lens? What am I thinking about? He says, think about your check. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm smiling. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but I did a scene with uh, Dan Rowan from Laugh-In. And Dan Ron was on the boat, and he was having 
problems with his girlfriend, and he looks at me, and I say, well, why don't you try this? And then he takes the advice, and he looks at me, and he goes, <laughs> good idea. And that's when I knew, wait a minute, wait a minute, something's going on here. And then uh, I would go out in life, and uh, people would see me in a restaurant or getting my hair cut or whatever. They would always go, hey, <laughs> oh, okay, this thing caught on. <laughs> and and, it, and it's, not, it's not with any thumbs. There, there's a proper way and an improper way to do it, correct? Yes. Yes, some people do it like this. <laughs> and some, yeah, some people do it like this or like that. <laughs> and I just say, no, you have to... You, you, what you do is you drop it. Drop it like it's hot. <laughs> All right, I, we have questions from the audience, but I kind of want to play a little game first. A little game. Yes! <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm trying to beat you, Teddy. <laughs> All right, we're going to play a game I call Most Likely. Okay, most likely. So out of the five of you, you're gonna to point to the person you think is most likely to do that thing or to fit that characteristic <laughs> person most likely, okay? First one up, person most likely to be the biggest flirt on set. to make you laugh the most. Go. <laughs> All right. Um, person most likely to have the messiest dressing room. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You know, you know, you know, you know. Okay, um, person most likely to be the best dressed. All these guys, they were, they always, these three always dressed. Always for Goodwill Industries, what are you, crazy? <laughs> you always cleaned up well. You guys all did. Yeah, I'm wearing my Salvation Armani jacket right now. <laughs> All right, person most likely to get lost while driving. <laughs> that was just around the set. I'm still waiting for you to get to my wedding. You have a wedding? <laughs> you have a wedding? I have three. <laughs> person most likely Person most likely to have the nicest garden. The nicest what? Nicest garden. Like now or then? Right now. Right now. Right here. Yeah. You got flowers. Oh, maybe two. Yeah. Okay. I think it's mine. Is my husband's. He's the. Oh, he's yeah. I love a genius. Yeah. Right. Person most likely to be the best dancer. <laughs> <laughs> Can you dance, Can you dance? Can you dance? Okay, all right. Cindy, you got cast like last second. What, why? Do you know why you got cast? Do you know? Did you audition? Was it a, uh, like the yes, I auditioned all day. <laughs> all day. I auditioned. I don't know. I was just lucky, I guess. And cute and adorable, with a smile that lit up the room and everything else. <laughs> you were ten years old. You know. <laughs> so I have a question. Uh, what were some of your favorite episodes? I liked Alaska a lot. You know, Julie didn't really have a lot of good luck with love. 
Um, and most of her boyfriends were pretty old. <laughs> Just saying. So I, I, it was always interesting for Julie. Yeah. As a young woman, I was surprised at the age of many of my boyfriends <laughs> when they showed up. Unlike Julia Prowse made Bernie so happy, I didn't have that experience. <laughs> <laughs> What about some of the rest of you? What are some of your favorite episodes? Some of your favorite episodes, maybe to film, maybe to watch now? Um, besides, obviously, the ones where we were really cruising, which were amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I think the musicals, yeah. which, it, that for me was the most fun. I'm a theater person. I, I like, uh, so. <coughs> this is gonna sound terrible, but why should the day be unlike any other day? <laughs> <laughs> I like the ones that I wrote. Started up writing for him. Yeah. These guys are great writers. Wrote for him. Writing friends. Wrote, wrote, wrote one for Gavin. Finally got around to writing, writing one for me with um, with Jill St. John. Oh, uh, yeah. Remember Jill St. John? Oh, yeah. 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 Um, and this, and uh, you know, I'm one of these actors that cannot watch the show. I just, I cannot watch myself. Oh, okay. And so it was, it, it was easier for me to watch him or him or her and somebody else. So that those those were my favorite episodes. Tell them about the Hong Kong. You and Gopher are not in this Hong Kong show oh. very much. Uh, oh. And so Fred and I read it, and we went back to it and said, we've got an idea. Can we kind of fatten out uh, Gopher and Isaac's part? And we did a thing with Gene Kelly. And That's right. Yvette and you, in which they are spies, and we think they're spies, so we follow them around Hong Kong. In, in trench coats and fedoras. Yes. <laughs> totally inconspicuous. Yes. Very subtle. And, uh, and uh, because of that, I, I, I learned part of my writing process was writing with Fred. And I eventually, when I was in high school in Oakland, California. <laughs> hey, Oakland! <laughs> Uh, one of my classmates was Anita Pointer, and oh. she was in a group called the Pointer oh, yeah. Sisters. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, this is how this had to work back at this time. Um, we had an Asian lady named Ellen Endo, and she was working for ABC uh, to approve stories. So I went to Ellen Endo and I said, listen, I have an idea uh, for an episode with the Pointer Sisters. Uh, it was tough for black writers at that time. So I said, uh, you know, I want to give this to the writers, but I think they're probably going to reject it. The side. They says, tell me the idea. I told her the idea. Uh, she says, go back with the script, give it to the writers, and then they'll give it to me, and I'll okay it. And that's what we did. I had a writing partner named Jean Ford. She and I wrote this Point of Sisters script. We went to Art and Ben and said, hey, God, I don't think, I don't think this is gonna work. I said, well, can you just, you know, pass it on to the network and see what they say? He said, well, who are the Pointer Sisters? No. I kid you not. Oh. And I said, well, they're a group and they're kind of famous and they did the songs in Beverly Hills Cop. Oh, Beverly Hills Cop, yeah, oh, all right. So we turned in the script, they passed it on to the network. My network liaison, Ellen Endo, said, good idea, it came back and we did this episode. And at the time we did the episode, they had a song called He's So Shy. You remember that, okay? And the idea was a record executive got on the uh, Princess Cruises and Isaac wanted to get a singing contract. So he enlists three ladies that are working, you know, at, in the cabins and they're his backup. But when he gets to the big moment, he loses his voice. 
<laughs> and so the girls take over, and they sing, and then they get the record contract. <laughs> and become the boys. You know, one of the things you have to remember, Duval, is that this show was an hour show. But there were always three stories on the show, which meant you had three times the responsibility to tell a story. And there was no other show like it. There really has not been another show that has successfully reproduced uh, that model. Which that, what that meant was they were always desperate for ideas. That's not always true on television programs. I mean, you get rejected more than you get hired. But they were so ravenous for stories that when Bernie and I started writing and, and, and others, they said, oh, thank God, thank you. Yeah, do another story for us. And, and, and they, were, they were more than accommodating. Um, for a lot of the stuff that we put in, because we were essentially bailing them out um, when they were running out of ideas. Yeah. So, and we felt that our dear friend, Ted Lange, was being underused. And uh, the guy to my right and myself got together and said, let's do something for Teddy, because he can't keep doing this. <laughs> Oh, no, he did this. No, 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 this. Oh, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> with, with one finger, or, or two, or, anyway. Anyway, <laughs> I think this came from uh, from Mr. Grandy. We said, why not write Isaac's history lesson? A brilliant concept. How do we do that? Well, there was a young black girl, and she was a student of black history. I think she was going for her master's, and she came on full of full of ideas to, to do this righteousness and everything else. Renee, Renee Watson was the actress. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And, and, and there was an older black man who was working at, a, at maybe the Dodger Stadium selling peanuts and popcorn. And this young lady had some, some level of contempt. Why is he lowering himself selling peanuts and popcorn? It turns out that he had been a star pitcher in the Negro Leagues. Scatman Brothers. Scatman Brothers. Brilliant casting. Brilliant casting. And eventually, there was a resolution uh, between the old black man and, and the young uh, black girl, and uh, he taught us the uh, handball. Yeah. 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 Hand yeah. hand we used to sit around on the set just like this, waiting to to work. And uh, one time we were sitting around on the set, and, and I said, "I'm from Oakland. Hey, you guys not do the handball?" Well, I knew the answer to that. <laughs> they didn't know how to do the handball. And I, they said, well, what's the handball? And I said, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Anyway, Fred and Bernie wrote that handball bit into the story. Yeah. And Scatman and I did it together. And we uh, yes. also, oh, excuse me. There was a scene on the Lido deck when Isaac and this old ball player start doing the hambo. But just before the scene started, Ted said to Scatman, Scat, you know the hambo? And Scat said, I invented the hambo. <laughs> when he did. Now writers can be very, uh, very uh, careful about, uh, about what they write and they don't want any changes. So Teddy and his then girlfriend were having a romance and they're on the deck and it's a gorgeous night, the stars in the sky. And she, having studied black history, said her line was supposed to be, our ancestors made a trip below decks in chains and never got to see any of this. So she substituted one word that threw the whole scene off, and I was very protective of her writing. She said, our ancestors made this trip. <laughs> said, hold it. Your ancestors didn't go to Acapulco. <laughs> so 
know, we, we straightened it out. Our ancestors made the triple Odex and chains and that because he not saw any of this. And that was a very heroic moment for Mr. Lange. Yeah. I think he probably came to you. Yeah, that episode that we're talking about with Isaac history lesson is on. Uh, also, uh, we've got another another question. More back to the question. That's question. Uh, are you all retired, and how often do you see each other? Well, um, in this, one of the great things about being an actor is there's no mandatory retirement age, so you go until you absolutely can't. And when you asked if we're still doing things, uh, Ken and I in this last year, and it was mostly occasioned by the pandemic when so many actors like ourselves were thrown out of work, formed this limited liability company with a couple of other people that we know and have worked with. And um, our whole plan was to start helping regional theaters, small regional theaters that were going broke during the pandemic because if you can't get people into the theater, you can't make any money. So it's called Give Them Hell Harry, which is about Harry Truman. And, uh, so we, we started doing it. I was playing Harry Truman. And Ted and I just were in Indiana. He just directed me in Give Him Hell Harry uh, there. And we've done it all over, over the country. He and I were going to go out and tour in a wonderful play called I'm Not Rappaport, which we had done in Syracuse. But of course, the pandemic put the kibosh on that. So the answer is yes. And, and that is really unique, the ball. Because I mean, there are there's camaraderie with other shows, but I, I, you know, Bernie has been in Ted's place. I go to see Ted's place. I was just talking to Cindy about doing a play together. Um, so I mean, this is this is an ensemble that has never disbanded, and I don't think and we never will. Now, about your okay, I will. Thank you, thank you. Everybody's a director. <laughs> anyway, just a few weeks uh, before coming here, I was doing a play in New York. So, you know, the question, do you, would you ever think about retiring? I said, God will tell me <laughs> when I can retire. I will never retire. Voluntarily. But anyway. will you listen? <laughs> <laughs> you <didn't> listen. <laughs> when was the last time I smacked you? <laughs> 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 well, that, was, that was great fun. And before I did that play, I played a Catholic priest on uh, Grey's Anatomy. Any rabbis out there? I did not convert. <laughs> Just want you to know. Retired. Um, uh, <laughs> um, at least not by choice. Um, I work for Princess Cruises, obviously, as a celebrations ambassador, which has just been an amazing, amazing opportunity. Um, and I'm also writing and producing as well. And I have some projects that are um, in a very exciting place. So one of them involves NASCAR. Um, I know, me, NASCAR, like, um, and then there's a few others that uh, are in a really exciting place development-wise that I'm hoping to share soon. Tell them about the thing we did together, the pilot. Tell me about oh. the thing you guys did together, the pilot. So, I have a okay. writing partner uh, named Leah Mangum. Her husband is Jonathan Mangum, for anybody who watches Let's, Let's Make, Make a Deal. deal. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, Leah and I wrote a pilot, uh, that's called Take It From The Top, it's on YouTube, that Mr. Lange was our dramaturg and also directed the show, and uh, he is obviously amazing. But it's a, fun, it's a fun show, and it's got some great people in it, so, including this one. Uh, <laughs> I, I am, if I can, I'm, I have to say a word about Bernie's show. The title of the show is called Two Jews Talking. <laughs> it's Bernie and Hal Linden. Okay? Between the two of them, they are 200 years old. All right? Now, At it's, least. it's two small one act plays. It runs about 70 minutes. And Ted's seen it, and it's hysterical. Okay? And it's two of, let's be honest, 
two comic legends, okay? Yeah. So, listen to this. Would you put that in writing? Yeah. <laughs> I've been saying to Bernie since we got on the ship, I said, Bernie, this is the perfect place to do that show. It's easy hey. to produce. You can do it out, you can do it in a big stage like this, you can do it out where you work. Ted so embarrassed himself on this. Still on, 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 on But I, I, I say, you know, it's 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 only seventy minutes, about the length of a of a club act. And I said, why not? And he he said, oh, well, I'm terribly concerned that there would be any Semites in the audience. Oh. And I would like all the anti Semites to stand up now, please, <laughs> and tell Bernie that you'll never come and see his show. Are you kidding me? This is Bernie Coppell. This is not some schmuck. I'm going to take that back because I know I'm better than you do. Well, on a cruise, you wouldn't come see that? Are there really any anti-Semites left that come to come to see this one? Please. I mean, it's not, it's not you're not asking him to perform a bris or anything. <laughs> uh, let me get back to these questions. Let me get back to these questions. I know they want to ask questions too. Let me get back to these questions. Did you all steal anything from the ship? Did you? <laughs> did you, did you keep any souvenirs from from the years while you were on the ship? Um, Lauren, she, she, Lauren wants it. I'm not going to call it stealing. <laughs> but on the last, when the very end of the show, like when we actually wrapped and they tore down the set all around us and gave us sandwiches on a paper plate and said, oh yeah, thanks. Remember that day? <laughs> I took a set piece that uh, you may recall I was replaced by Judy McCoy. So the cruise director's door now at the end said Jay McCoy, just in case it was either one of us, I guess. And so I took, I have a sign that says Jay McCoy, cruise director. <laughs> when you direct a show, I was lucky enough to direct television, and the first show I directed was on Love Boat. Whoa. Um, they, you've seen those clappers? Yeah. Uh, I didn't steal this, but this is a wonderful <laughs> tradition that they do in show businesses. When it's your first directorial uh, effort, they give you the clapper with the last scene and act on the clapper, and then the crew signs it. Oh, nice. All right, and so I've, I've got that, and I just have to say, my first um, scene was with Fred that I directed. My first scene was with Fred and Susan Strasberg. Right. Okay? Wow. So this is the first time, I've, I've been directing theater for years, but this was my first television directing thing, I was a little nervous. We rehearsed the scene, and I noticed that Susan Strasberg missed a beat that was a comedic beat. So I said, well, uh, I'm not gonna go tell her her father's Lee Strasberg, one of the <laughs> premier guys in acting. So we'll just rehearse it again, because she'll see the beat. We rehearsed it again. She missed it again. Oh man, I'm gonna actually have to. I'm gonna have to direct her. So I went over to Susan Strasberg, the daughter of Lee Strasberg, and I said, "Susan, there's this beat here. Uh, could you hit that beat there when we do the scene again?" And it seemed like. An hour had gone by before she answered me. <laughs> but it was only five seconds or whatever. And right. she said, yeah, sure, of course. 
Well, after that, I was gold, baby. <laughs> hey, and we locked and rolled. I campaigned, I think, for years. Please let me direct. And they said, mm, well, I don't know. And they just did not let him direct. Finally, they said, okay, <laughs> you can direct. So he's directing this particular uh, scene between Alejandro Rey and a beautiful lady. And he is a swordsman. Not necessarily in that sense. <laughs> but he is suspecting me of having some interest in his girlfriend. So he's supposed to be chasing me and I hide under, under an area and his line is supposed to be, you lily-livered coward, which is not easy for anyone to say. So he gets to that point, he's almost got me and he says, you lily living comma. <laughs> so Teddy says, cut. Uh, cut. So on, on, we, we, using a lot of time here. Do it again. Okay. Action. You living loving. <laughs> so Mr. Lamb says, Alejandro, come here. Whisper something in his ear. And the scene continues. Okay, action. And he gets to that point again, and he says, because of what Ted whispered in his ear, you big chicken! <laughs> he solved the problem. Do you remember the name of the episode? Do you remember the name of the episode? Which ones they were? Uh, which one? The one that we were talking about, the one? Uh, do you remember the name of that yeah, episode? I don't remember you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? Uh, they kind of mush together at a certain they point do. in yeah. your memory. We have ten seasons. I can't even remember the name of the Pointer Sister episode. <laughs> and I wrote it. That's one of those brilliant directors for so Amen. Amen many that. reasons. He comes to work so prepared for every scene. He has such incredible comedic timing. He is an actor's director. He is so generous to his actors. He makes it a safe place to try things and to make mistakes and to be out. Thank you. And speaking about uh, directing bosses and things, uh, Aaron Spelling, what was he like? A lovely man. Remote? He was remote. <laughs> He, he had a history that, that is astonishing for a gigantic producer. His father was a tailor, an impoverished tailor, in a little place in Texas. Dallas, Texas. And he wanted to be an actor. He tried to be an actor, and that didn't work. And then he started working with Dick Powell. Remember Dick Powell? Yeah. I yes. love when the crickets come. <laughs> And he, <laughs> that's your story. Anyway, he just became the most successful producer in the industry. And he was our great boss for all of these years and gave us the opportunity to do this show. Well, all right. And the other thing about Aaron was that because he had been an actor, I think he had a feeling for actors. and. Very quickly, our show became a, an oasis for other actors. They were paid well. Every so often, they got to take one of these fabulous trips. And, and we, I didn't know him that well, because I was pretty low on the, on the food chain. And he, you know, he was dealing with larger stars. And that, that's fine. But everybody, everybody was well treated on that show. And the show had a reputation for treating actors well. And that's something that was somewhat rare in the industry. The only impression that I had, the one thing that he could not tolerate, that he couldn't countenance, was betrayal. Wow. And, and too often, it's, it's um, a common suicide mission. Actors get on a hit show, and somehow they, they cannot deal with this sudden success and they'll get too big for themselves or they'll start saying things about 
the producer and or they'll walk off the show. And of course, Aaron had had that with stuff like Charlie's Angels. Farrah Fawcett walked off the show after becoming a big star. And I think that that was something that he always had a hard time with. Now, in our case, that wasn't necessarily the, the case. But, but even though he was, as Bernie said, remote, and we saw him rarely, and he often didn't even see us, we were always, I think, well treated. And, and again, if you're in this business for a long time, that's the exception and not the rule. We liked making chocolate chip cookies, so we would, I mean, what do you give the man who has everything, the literal biggest house in the world, oh, yeah. which is his private residence, so we would bake, and we would do cookies and cakes and fill this stocking up, and he was so appreciative every year, and it wasn't until years later when I read his biography that I learned that he grew up impoverished, like Bernie said, living above a bakery. And because his family couldn't afford food, the bakery would bring up all their leftover sweets at the end of the day. So he hated sweets. <laughs> hated. But I would have never known that because every time it was a lovely thank you note and he would call. So. <laughs> So he never took a cruise with us because he could never get to the ship. He was, he was about to get on a plane one day and his mother made him promise not to get on that plane. And, he went through? and the plane crashed. Oh, yeah. So he never flew. And that's why he had such a big house. He said, I don't vacation other places. My house is my vacation. Well, so. he did travel once, I remember, because we, we, were, we, were, um, we normally shot out of Los Angeles, San Pedro for your own location. Right. But at one point we were sailing out of Miami. I think it was Miami or Fort Lauderdale, I'm not sure. Anyway, Aaron doesn't fly, but he wanted to come because it was a fairly big production. So he did what anybody would do. He bought a train. <laughs> he bought a train and took it across the country. Not a big train, you know, but still a, a train and an engine, you know. And, and, you know, that was just, that's what he did. Because he could. <laughs> all right. He did come on the ship. Are you remember? Gotcha, gotcha. That's about all the questions I have from the get. I have a couple more questions for, me, for you, though. What is, what is one of the funniest moments that's happened on set while you were filming? Maybe while you were on the ship? Because cause you weren't always filming on the ship. You weren't always in set. Oh, on set. So what was one of the funnier things? We were often on the set. <laughs> we were often there. I remember us, all, well, before Jill was, um, when Jill was just a passenger as the captain's daughter, you were not yet a crew member, however that worked. Right. Well, your <laughs> yeah. But I remember the four of us standing in many lines in Gavin's office, standing on a four-inch piece of tape that the four of us had to fit on, and those were some pretty funny times. We did crack up a couple times, didn't we, guys? My there favorite was, is there was some giggling. When Henry Coleman had to come down and threaten Ted, because Ted wouldn't stop laughing. I got the giggles. You do not want to get the giggles. And yeah, we got the giggles, and I laughed from 10 o'clock in the morning to 4 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> and we broke for lunch, and I thought I was good after I came back for lunch, and I was not good. <laughs> he was supposed to be sleeping in a little cot. There was something, there was a flood on the ship, and everybody was in the captain's office. And so you would see Ted's cot with him in it, and you would just see <laughs> that little tushy. <laughs> laughing. That's the day you knew you were famous. Yeah, that was it. I knew they couldn't fire me at this point. So I just enjoyed the laugh. It was a good laugh. No, loads, loads of good moments. Years and years of memories made. Uh, last question. One last question. Looking back on your time on the love boat, what are you the most grateful for? Yeah. Um, clearly.
clearly the ensemble. But there's one more thing that we have not talked about. And generally, we have these forums. The, the questions are, who was your favorite guest star? What was your favorite uh, destination? And also, but, but there's one thing, and I think it's important since this crowd is, is so enthusiastic and has been so dedicated and loyal. Um, and this is something that only could have happened on a prince's ship that was empowered by the love boat. And this happened to me uh, when we took our trip to the Far East. And the last place we were gonna shoot was Japan. Now, at that time, my two older kids, not my daughter Monica who's with me on this cruise, but my two older kids, uh, were gonna join with me in Japan. And to get them over there, because they were 10 and eight, we needed somebody to fly with them. Well, it turned out that there was uh, a nanny that we knew who worked for another family. And her name was Gloria Malloy. And she was from Oklahoma, but she was half Japanese. And she'd never been to Japan. Hmm. And so we said, well, all right, Gloria, will you, you bring the kids over? And we started to think about this and we thought, well, well, Gloria's still got relatives in Japan who she's never met, and they've never met her. So through the consulate, we were able to arrange a visit to her cousin or uncle or, or whatever it was. And so my two kids and, and I and, and Gloria went to see this Japanese family. Never met them. She spoke no Japanese. They spoke no English. When we arrived, it was as if she was coming back from the war. I mean, it was just, oh, Gloria. I mean, it was just wonderful. We sat there for two or three hours. Nobody understood <laughs> each other. And it was constant communication. We all got it, OK? The host kept pouring me big tumblers of Suntory whiskey, <laughs> which I drank because I didn't want to be rude. <laughs> well, later in the ambulance, <laughs> uh, that wasn't such a good idea. But, but, but now think about this. Gloria Malloy, United States citizen, half Japanese, her family reunited. And I, 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 I don't know what happened to Gloria, but, but I, I assume she might have kept in touch with us. Would that have happened anywhere but on the love boat? That's an opportunity you'll, you'll never see in one of our clips. But to me, that's the most important and poignant move, moment I ever had on the show because I said, my God, we're actually doing something good here that transcends enjoying the show and putting on you know, uh, an entertaining evening. And, and again, this is not something that could have happened anywhere else. But because of the partnership between Princess and Love Boat, and the rest of the world. I have this to say about uh, the, the, the glory of uh, John Forsyth, who uh, who guessed it on the on the uh, China show, the China the China Wall. Uh, I'm a tennis player, and uh, I was in Monaco, and John Forsyth was in Monaco, and there was a man who had a monumentally gorgeous multi-zillion dollar uh, yacht and he invited Forsyth and Wayne Rogers and myself for lunch one day. I said, oh, this is really wonderful. So lunch is over and the man is very happy after eating his wonderful meal and, and so are we and he's sitting on the indoor, indoor deck and he said, no, after that meal, I feel like sex. <laughs> and Forsyth had a diabolical sense of humor. And after the man said that, I was here, Forsyth was there, the man was there, and he said, burn. <laughs> John Forsyth, <laughs> diabolical. I, I just wanted to say thank you genuinely from the bottom of our hearts 
for being so loving and enthusiastic. It is, it is, I mean, who would have thought this many years later? And we all had the same experience. We all did. We all were together cruising and we all fell in love with cruising together and we all fell in love with falling in love. So we share something together and we are so grateful that we get to experience it here with you today. So thank you. If someone to go, Bernie. Ladies and gentlemen, let's give it up for the time of the love time. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord.